around. Why are you here? It's 70 and sunny out. When I was in college, we had an unwritten rule that said if it was 70 and sunny out, you didn't go to class. I asked Joanne, is there a clicker? Are you checking for attendance? You guys are just here because you want to be here? Because you think there might be some exam material and you want to be prepared for it? Thank you for being here. I appreciate the respect and the courtesy. I must admit, when I was driving in, I was thinking to myself, is there any way I could get out of this? Because it's so gorgeous outside, like one of the prettiest falls I've ever seen in the state of Michigan. Uh, let me begin by introducing myself. My name is Shima. Uh, don't call me sir, mister, professor, doctor. It's a unique name. It's Croatian. My parents were born and raised in Croatia. So the name is Shima. It takes a little practice. Uh, I don't like being called doctor because I've reached a point in my life where I don't want to feel old because I'm actually old now. So I'm not aging gracefully, and I don't like to be called things that remind me that I am old. In fact, if you yelled for a doctor because you were choking on a pretzel and you needed someone to do the Heimlich maneuver, I'm running out of the room. If you needed CPR and you yelled for a doctor, I'm running out of the room. So I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't even know what CPR stands for. So I'm not even close to being a doctor. I went to graduate school for five years, and I can test mathematical models that look at relationships between things like quality and cost. And trust me when I say, I don't think being an educated idiot that can run those models justifies me being called a doctor. So I just I avoid that. Call me Shima. It takes slow practice. The one pager that went around has all of my contact information in the upper corner there. You can reach out to me anytime you want for any reason that you want between now and graduation or after graduation. All right, this is marketing 2500. Let me try to get a feel for who you are. I'm guessing over half of you are business majors and or want to be business majors. A lot of you think you know what you want to major in. Some of you are a little wishy-washy and could go either way, and then some of you have no idea what you actually want to major in. You've just gravitated towards the business college, and that's a great start. And then some of you are majors outside of the college, but someone in your major said that having this marketing 2500 class is really important. So my goal here is I'm going to try to explain to you what supply chain management is in kind of an interesting and exciting way with the mindset that I'm gonna brainwash you into thinking it's the coolest thing in the world and you will wanna change your major. If that's not the case at the end of this class, that's fine, I'm just going into this. You gotta make this interesting. You can't go in there and say, supply chain management is three distinct yet interrelated functional areas, those being purchasing, operations, and logistics management. You already fell asleep. You fell asleep halfway through that definition, so I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna show you what people are doing in supply chain management to give you a feel for what this major entails. I will begin by saying job placement, starting salaries, all of that stuff is through the roof and has never been better. I've been at Western 17 years, and I'll talk to people out there, I'll watch the news, and they'll talk about how bad the economy is and how bad it is for college graduates. Most of those people have no idea what they're talking about. If you come to college and make a bunch of great decisions, you will have jobs when you graduate, and chances are you'll have multiple job offers. You just have to make a bunch of great decisions. One of the most important decisions that you can make at the undergraduate level isn't necessarily where you go to college, but it's what you major in. And if what you major in uh, has economic conditions where demand exceeds supply, you're well on your way to getting a great paying job when you graduate. So I try to give my students some general advice on if you want five job offers when you graduate for 50, 60, 70K a year, what are some of the decisions that you have to make? I will admit, what I'm noticing is the more niche, specialized, and focused that you can get with your major, that's where the jobs are at. There aren't a lot of companies out there saying, I have an entry-level managerial position, I'm looking for a college graduate straight out of school, and I want them to be able to do everything. You just came out of college. If you look at most job descriptions for entry-level managerial positions, they tend to be very focused, very niche, and very specialized. They expect you to have a bunch of strategic skill sets, but they expect you to work within this very specialized area. So if you look at the majors, degrees, and programs where demand exceeds supply, where salaries are through the roof, where students get multiple job offers when they graduate, it tends to be in those very niche, specialized areas. For example, you can major in general marketing, but I would argue that for, uh, for entry-level managerial positions, there aren't a lot of companies out there saying, I want a 22-year-old that can do this in marketing. However, there's a bunch of companies out there that say, I want sales marketing. I want food marketing. I want advertising and promotion. Uh, there aren't a lot of companies out there saying, I'm looking for a general management major for this entry-level managerial position. This job right here tends to be a mid-level position or higher. You're not going to be interviewing for that kind of job. So 
There are companies out there that say, I want someone that majors in human resources management. One of the hottest degrees out there right now, and it's not going to change anytime soon because chances are the topic isn't going to become less important moving forward, is supply chain management. So instead of general management, we have employers telling us, I want your students to major in this, supply chain management, and then within that, I want a bunch of strategic skill sets. The end result is demand exceeds supply, and the starting salaries are in the 50s and 60s. In the ISM Integrated Supply Management or Supply Chain Management program, we got near perfect job placement. Almost all of our students graduate with multiple internship experiences. Most of the internships pay between $14 and $23 an hour. The average starting salary in supply chain management uh, is in the mid 50s and we have a couple of companies that are offering students uh, over 60K a year. One of them is an automotive OEM headquartered in Metro Detroit and downtown Detroit that's offering our students 64K straight out of school. What I tell my students to get a job offer from General Motors for 64K is congratulations, you're not worth it. That's awesome. Anytime you can get a job for more than what you're worth, you did very, very well, right? Uh, and I, I joke when I say that, but yeah, what 22, 23 year old is worth 64K a year? But maybe they're good at something that companies are willing to pay a premium for, and that's what I'll talk about a little bit here. Some of the general decisions that you can make the next one, two, three, four years, depending on how long you're going to be here, is one, pay attention to what you're majoring in. Does demand exceed supply? If supply exceeds demand, that might mean that you're unemployed when you graduate or you take a job that's very low paying. Uh, I would take your grades very, very seriously. We've reached a point where it's so competitive out there, companies are saying, you need at least a 3.0 GPA. There's some HR person at the corporate level telling the hiring managers that are going to be interviewing you, you can't even look at a resume unless it's a 3.0 or above. So a lot of the Fortune 500 elitist types of companies, they have a 3.0 as a cutoff. And then there's another wave of companies that have a 2.7 as a cutoff, but I don't know of a lot of companies out there that are okay with less than a 2.7 GPA. So try to take your grades as seriously as possible. Probably the most important thing outside of what major you pick based on supply and demand conditions is getting work experience related to what you're majoring in. Employers are saying I want them to be job ready day one and they have to be able to prove to me that when I hire them they can make an immediate contribution. So do whatever it takes to get work experience related to what you're majoring in. If that means delaying graduation, so be it. At least you have a job when you graduate versus being unemployed. And like I said, most of the internships within the business college in these niche specialized areas, they pay really well, so it's not like you're doing it for free. Uh, some other decisions. Uh, get to know your professors in your major. I teach in the supply chain program or integrated supply management, ISM, and I would say at least half the companies call me up and ask me about the student that they're interviewing. And if I don't know who the student is, the manager takes that as a very negative. Uh, so get to know the professors in your major to the point where they know you, they recognize you, and they call you by your first name because they see you that much. Most of the professors in the business college, th this is the best part of our job, is helping you live the American dream. And if we can get you there, that's job satisfaction for us. Yeah, I wouldn't do this for free, but I'm not going to get promoted anymore. I know exactly how much I'm going to be making 30 years from now. My benefits package, because I'm in a union, probably isn't going to change too much. All I've got left to hang my hat on, and the professors in general, is can we help you live the American dream? And if you can come out of school with a great paying job that has advancement opportunities associated with it, where the sky's the limit, or you can job hop to a higher bidder, that's a part of the American dream because that helps you pay the bills. And I would say in general, if you're 22, 23, and you're coming out making 45, 55, 65K a year, you're well on your way to living that dream. And you can do that if you make a bunch of great decisions while you're in college. So take your grades seriously, get to know your professors, pick the right major, uh, get work experience related to what you're majoring in. Another one that I'm noticing is, uh, uh, like right now, could you pass a drug test if you took one right now? Yeah, of course you're going to say yes. I had a student in my class this semester where I did this. He goes, I can't. I, I wouldn't be able to pass it. I'm like, why would you say that in front of your professor? Lie. Of course I could pass a drug test. And then I said, what drugs? And no, I didn't. But um, right answer. Uh, for any internship now, you're going to either have to pee in a cup or they're going to take a huge piece of your hair. They'll tell you stuff like, we can go back 30 to 60 days. If they're willing to pay enough money and they take a large enough hair sample, they can go back 90 to 120 days. Uh, so when I was in college, it was awesome. For internships, we didn't have to take a drug test. I've never taken a drug test in my life. Uh, for all of my full-time jobs, and I say that's awesome because I didn't have to take one. I, I joke a little bit. I was like, yeah, I get to do drugs and still get a job. Um, Sidetracked a little bit there. 
so I didn't even have to take one when I came to Western. We've reached a point where 40% of the world's lawyers are American. 2.4% of our economy is lawsuits. That's three times the average of other industrialized nations. And the trial lawyers of America are the fifth most powerful lobbying power in Washington. My point there is there's so much liability associated with hiring you, the companies have to practice due diligence. So what they're saying is, I want to test you for drugs for an internship, definitely for a full-time job. So you've got to start making decisions now based on when do you want to get these work experiences. Uh, and you have to time it accordingly if, if what's implied is that you have to stop doing something to pass that test. I felt like I had to have that conversation because when I first came to Western, employers didn't really require it for internships. And then even for some full-time jobs, they didn't require But over a 17-year time period, everyone's doing it. They've outsourced it, and they'll actually say, go to this site on this date. They'll give you a window, and if you don't do it within that window, they withdraw your application for consideration for employment. So I think those are some generic decisions that you can make that will help you be more successful. All right, supply chain management. Um, let me draw a little bit of a picture here. Let's say you work for a company or you have your own company, okay, and you sell something for a dollar or they sell something for a dollar. Okay. After you sell something for a dollar, a product or a service, let's assume you're a manufacturing company, and you pay for all of your bills. So you sold it for a dollar because that's really what the market will allow for in terms of what people are willing to pay you. You sell something for a dollar, you pay for all of your bills, pick on you a little bit, you just paid for all of your bills, how much would you like to have left over when it's all said and done? Where it's reasonable, you feel like it's competitive, and it's worthwhile. Or your employer would say, yeah, that's pretty good. Or if it's your own business, you're going to keep reloading. So how, how much would you like to have left over? Uh, Give me a number. Give me a number. You sell something for a dollar, you pay for all of your bills. What would you like left on the table? Uh, yeah. Ooh. You want some big numbers. OK. Uh, can you do that legally? OK. Um, I, I, I like it. I, I think Apple has those kind of numbers. Not everyone's like Apple, though. Here, here's reality. There are a bunch of companies out there that sell something for a dollar. This is how much they have left over after they pay for all their bills. Can you think of an industry where that's definitely the case? Uh, yeah, yeah, yep. Grocery retail. Um, something that's near and dear to me is the automotive industry. They're selling cars and trucks like crazy right now. In 2008, car and truck sales fell by 50%. In 2009, Michigan's unemployment was 15%. And if you include the people that just quit looking for jobs, it's probably around 25%. That's the Great Recession. And that was caused by car and truck sales dropping by 50% because of the real estate bubble that burst, the banking crisis, and all that. Unfortunately, we live in a state that doesn't have a diversified economy. It revolves around manufacturing and specifically automotive. West Michigan, Southwest Michigan, the economy revolves around agriculture and manufacturing, but it doesn't revolve around automotive. We've got a diversified economy on this side of the state. However, over half of the state's population lives in the metro Detroit area, and industry revolves around the auto industry. So here's the good news, is now that car and truck sales are through the roof, uh, unemployment in the state of Michigan is below the national average. We're at 5%, but what happens during the next recession when people stop buying cars and trucks? And the good news there as well is, if you look at demographics, and I forgot to mention this, there's never been a better time to be in college and going into the workforce, because if you look at the demographics of the workforce, the largest composition of America's workforce right now is baby boomers, people born between 1945, 1950, 1955. If you do the math, those people are in their 60s, they're gonna be in their 70s if they're not there already, and they're not gonna probably be working into their 70s and 80s and 90s. My point is, when I went into the workforce, it was a bunch of baby boomers, but they were in their 30s and 40s. And I was at a competitive disadvantage because what are the chances of me getting promoted ahead of those people that have 5, 10, 15, 20 years worth of work experience on me and they're not leaving anytime soon. So when you go into the workforce, my prediction is if you make a bunch of great decisions, you're going to advance and get promoted into jobs quicker than any other generation in American history has because the largest segment of our workforce is going to be gone. So you're going to get a promotion at 25, 30, 40 that might have taken me until I was 55, 60, 65 to get because of all those baby boomers in the workforce. So I think demographically, 
there's never been a better time. Specifically, if I had to identify one industry, the automotive, which the Michigan economy revolves around, they've gotten rid of the dinosaurs and the baby boomers. If you look at a company like General Motors, it's a bunch of 20-somethings and 30-somethings. The culture's changed because it's a bunch of young people now. So I think it's an exciting time to be in the state of Michigan, to be a college student, to be graduating because of the opportunities. Uh, for the first time in over 10 years, over half of our students that are graduating from the supply chain program are staying in the state of Michigan. I went through a 10, 15 year stretch where I had to see over half of our in-state students leave the state of Michigan because the state of Michigan didn't have jobs, but everywhere else did. That's changed, it's nice to see that come back. And I think the auto industry has gotten rid of a lot of its fat so that long term, we should be just fine when we go through the next recession. Again, I'm obviously a GM guy, but they probably have 10 billion in cash right now so that when they go through a recession, they don't have to go out of business. They don't have to borrow money from banks. They can go through that, lose a little money, and still have billions on hand so that when car and truck sales pick up again, they're reloading and reinvesting. So back to this example, I would argue that if you sell something for a dollar, if you look at manufacturing companies that are in saturated, super competitive industries, that's what they have left over when it's all said and done. So now you're thinking, why the heck would you be in that business? Well, a company like General Motors, yeah, they'll sell something for a dollar. They might have one, two, three cents left over. But they do $150 billion a year in annual sales revenue. So when you look at the money that they have left over, they might have $10 billion in cash when it's all said and done after one year. So they can still make a lot of money. They're just, their margins aren't very good. However, that's unacceptable to any investor out there and anyone running a company. You can't sell something for a dollar, pay full up for all of your bills, and only have one penny left over. But in saturated competitive markets that are globally competitive, this is the nature of it. So my question is, let's say you're the CEO and you work for a company that sells something for a dollar and you only have one, two, or three cents left over. How, what can you do to make more money? Think, think, think of it from a marketing standpoint. If I sell something for a dollar and I got one cent left over. What could I do to make sure that I have two cents or three cents left over? Yeah? Build a better brand, which is implied by. Ah, okay. What's implied by a competitive global bloodbath in saturated industries, there's not a lot of wiggle room based on supply and demand conditions and um, competition to necessarily raise prices. But, but that's definitely a strategy. If you look at the auto industry, what are their margins better on? The ones, the products that have brand name recognition and image. When you buy a Cadillac, they've got awesome margins on Cadillacs. Why those things sell for 50 to 100K a year? What you don't realize is Cadillac, Chevy, GMC, and Buick, they make those vehicles at the same place, at the same time, using the same resources, the same people, the same tools and equipment, what they do is they offer different options and packages, slap it on at the very end and say, oh, this is a different vehicle, it's a Cadillac, we're gonna make 15K here, whereas on the GMC, we're barely making any money at all. But if you love that product, maybe down the road, you'll buy the one that makes us 15K. What we could do in this situation, would you guys agree that if you doubled sales, you can make more money? Like if I sell something for a dollar and I got a penny left over, if I go into my company and we do something magical where we double sales, uh, would you agree that that would help us make more money? But do you think that's what companies like John Deere, IBM, Boeing, General Motors, Chrysler are doing? Do you actually think they're sitting around saying, let's double sales revenue next year, let's double market share, let's double our volumes? They're sitting around saying, how can we prevent market share from shrinking versus necessarily increasing? So these companies are in a really bad situation because they have to make more money, but they can't make more money by selling more stuff because the market's so saturated and so competitive. So if you're in a situation where you can't increase sales revenue to make more money, but you have to make more money, how do you make more money? Decrease costs. Exactly, you cut costs, okay? That's what these companies are obsessed with. They want to do things better, faster, and cheaper. Look at it this way. If you, uh, if you go into that company and you say, let's double sales revenue, it's going to be a pain in the butt. It's going to be a lot of work.